Hey, uh, good afternoon and, and, and welcome. We're glad for you guys to join us. Um, and, and now we're with, with the state health officer to talk about coronavirus and to answer your questions. The, the main thing we want to do is, is uh, answer the questions you've submitted. Um, I have not read them previously, so I look forward to discussing them with you. Just as a, a quick sort of overview, you know, we're still knee deep in this coronavirus situation. We had a pretty, a pretty rough summer with a uh, market increase in the number of cases, but fortunately hitting the back end of July and going through August, we saw a pretty significant decline in cases. We um, continue to see um, uh, some stabilization and, and, and modest decreases uh, over the past couple of weeks, but we know we're still at risk, so we have to be very, very careful. Today we're going to report, uh, we're reporting 505 additional cases and sadly 28 additional deaths. So, so please be safe going into the next next few months before we have a vaccine. We got to be continue to be very careful because we're doing a good job right now. So please keep up the good work, social distancing, uh, masks, small groups, and um, protect your neighbors. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll go ahead and turn it over to the Q and A. Uh, well, did you want to enter? Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Liz Charlotte. I'm the communications director, and I have taken all your questions and put them together. We appreciate you sending them in. And I also want to introduce our state epidemiologist, Dr. Paul Byers. Thank you. Okay. So what we're going to start with now is what we're calling mythbusters and regarding rumors. And these are just true and false. So I just want you guys to answer true or false and give one sentence to explain it. Okay, uh, Thomas, Dr. Dobbs, masks are ineffective. Yeah, you know, we've learned a lot about masks and we know that they work. True or yes, false? true. Okay. True, they're, they're effective. They are effective. True, they're effective. Um, we have learned a lot about masks. Um, there are uh, studies that show within healthcare settings just wearing a normal surgical mask and eye protection is very effective. And we know that it does a great job at um, slowing down super spreaders and it definitely keeps people from contagious to giving it to other people. And we think it actually does a really good job of reducing the viral exposure to people who are wearing it. All right, Dr. Byers, there is a big financial incentive to label anything COVID-19. People that died in car wrecks have been labeled COVID-19 if they were positive, true or false? False. You know, we get deaths reported from multiple different ways at the Department of Health, from doctors, from healthcare facilities, from hospitals. One of the ways we get them is through vital records or death certificate data. We review every one of those death certificates that makes a mention of COVID-19 to determine if it actually fits and meets the criteria for being a death that's associated or related to COVID-19. Yeah, I think there's a misconception out there about uh, the labeling of death with COVID-19. COVID yeah, and, and I'll just add real quickly, what funding we get at Health Department is not impacted by the number of COVID cases, right? So there's a disconnect. Um, hospitals, there is a, a mechanism for hospitals to get reimbursed for COVID patients that are uninsured, but that's a very different sort of thing. So it's hospitalized patients getting reimbursed for uninsured. Okay. Um, Dr. Byers, MSDH has stopped reporting hospitalization numbers, true or false? No, we, we still report uh, hospitalizations and we have that data on our website in a couple of different ways. So uh, I would encourage folks, look at our website. There's lots of useful information on there. We do still report hospitalizations. We also um, have data that reports by hospital the availability for beds, the availability of ICUs, the current number of cases that they have that are COVID related. So we do report that data. Okay, Dr. Dobbs, you're not telling us how many people have actually recovered. Um, that's true. Um, it's, it's an estimate. We do presume recover. Yeah, we do presume recover, but um, we, uh, we have a calculation the CDC gave us on, on recovered folks, but we do not track down everybody who's had COVID and interview them, obviously. But uh, based on the formulas applied by CDC, we report out the presumed recovery numbers. And, and it is an estimate. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Dobbs, COVID is just a hoax. It is not a hoax. I, I, I tell you, um, I'll be very happy when it's no longer such an issue, but it, it, it's killed um, around 200,000 Americans. Almost a million people documented uh, have died worldwide. Um, it's, it's, you know, really been devastating in so many ways, interrupting our lives. So um, it is very much real. Okay, Dr. Byers, we can trust a COVID vaccine when it becomes available, true or false? 
Well, I, you know, certainly we're not going to recommend a, a vaccine unless we feel that it is safe and that it works. And there's going to be a number of vaccines coming down the, the, the line here. Uh, they're currently going through both safety trials and efficacy trials to determine how well they, they protect you against COVID-19 infection and how well they may reduce the severity of illness. And so those trials are still ongoing, um, but stay tuned. There'll be more data out there. And certainly from the Department of Health and Dr. Dobbs and myself, we are not going to recommend a vaccine unless we feel comfortable with the safety data and the efficacy data. Thank you. Dr. Dobbs, MSDH manipulates the numbers. That's why there are so many corrections to the deaths previously reported. Um, that, True is, or false? that is totally false. Um, you know, we have a very um, uh, labor intensive way to make sure that the numbers are, are going to be correct, right? And so for the death numbers, we get those multiple mechanisms. Some of them the hospitals will call us, but sometimes they come through vital statistics and the, the, or the death, death certificate. And sometimes there's a delay in that process because it takes a while for us to get them. So uh, no, we are very thorough in trying to make sure and for the deaths piece, because we're so thorough and we have a pretty restrictive mechanism of doing it, uh, we feel like we're probably undercounting the deaths a little bit. I was gonna ask you about that. Okay, uh, we'll stay with Dr. Dobbs. The daily case numbers are not reported directly from MSDH. They're given to MSDH from Washington, D.C. Really? People think that? <laughs> yeah. No, no, they're from us. Um, we have a, um, a, a host of mechanisms through which we get disease reports. It's, it's similar to um, other diseases like tuberculosis or syphilis where we have uh, mandated reporting where these have to be reported to us if they're positive and they come straight to us and they go straight out to you guys. And, and if I could add, we have um, a team of epidemiologists in our office who work day and night to receive all of those reports, determine if they're a case, and then be able to report those out each day. So it is a very labor intensive process. Yeah, um, it takes a long time to do, and you guys are to be commended for everything you do on the website. A lot of people need to really go to the, the website because it has a lot of information that you guys ask about. Okay, um, Dr. Byers, certain blood types are more susceptible to severe cases of COVID-19, true or false? Well, I, I would say at this point that that's, that's false, but there's still a lot of information to learn about how COVID affects people and the, the effect that it may have based on your immune system, your age, what it leads to in the severity of illness. So, I mean, I think there's still a whole lot that we have to learn, but Dr. Dobbs? Yeah, I mean, the fixation on blood tech is a little bit curious. It's just it's just a marker protein on a blood cell it has no real relevance to so many things. So um, I'd say, you know, it might, it could potentially be a marker, um, but I really don't think so. Okay, Dr. Dobbs, an employee needs to test negative before returning to work. True oh, or yeah. False? No, false, false. So if someone has is diagnosed with coronavirus and has a positive test, um, please do not retest them. Uh, we know um, that um, if they wait those 10 days, after they're they're ill that they um, should no longer be contagious but the test will stay positive for weeks and maybe even months and, and they're not contagious it's basically sort of remnant rna sort of leftover almost like genetic dust that'll trigger the test positive but it does not mean they're contagious so do your 10 days isolation after you get it and stop please don't retest because it'll cause a lot of consternation okay i think it's a good time to to ask you dr dobbs um True or false, isolation and quarantine mean the same thing? No, they're very different and it's very important to keep keeping our minds differently. Isolation is the period of time that someone who's contagious needs to stay away from other people. Um, that's 10 days is how long we have that as a, um, as a mandate. It's an order to, um, to be uh, isolated if you're contagious, if you have coronavirus because we know you can be contagious for that long. Um, you can actually be a little bit longer than that if you are severely ill, like you're in the hospital on the ventilator, or if you have profound underlying immunosuppression. Quarantine is a very different thing. Quarantine is for people who might have been exposed and they're waiting to see if they get sick. And the quarantine period is 14 days because we know that you can go from up to 14 days from the point of exposure before you develop symptoms. And so we wanna wait that four, full 14 days to make sure that you don't have symptoms um, before you get back into public. Okay. Uh, Dr. Byers, 
all types of COVID tests are equal, antigen, PCR, antibodies, true or false? False. So there are a couple of different main types of tests. There's the, the viral tests that are really for detecting acute infection or new infection or when you have an ongoing infection. So if you're sick, those are the kinds of tests that tell you yes or no if, it, if it's COVID related. So those are the PCR tests and that's, you know, the nasal swab that, that folks hear about. And the PCR usually has to go off to the lab, but there are some rapid forms that can be done at, at that point of care. The other one is antigen, and that's also a swab test, and that's a test that can tell you yes or no is your, is your infection or your symptoms due to, to COVID. So those are for acute. And then there's antibody tests, and those are tests that's a blood test, really, that looks for evidence of previous infection by looking for antibodies that your body has developed as a result of having that infection at some point in the past. And so the antibody test can be used to say, yeah, I've had the infection potentially in the past. Okay, um, we'll go back to Dr. Dobbs. Um, vitamin D can help prevent COVID-19 infection. Um, I would say uh, false, we don't have any evidence of that. Um, so we can't depend on vitamins to get us out of this. I mean, it's the simple things we know to do, the masks, the spacing, mm -hmm. and just staying away from folks. But um, vitamin D, zinc, uh, vitamin C, um, there's nothing to suggest that they can protect you. Okay. Um, what about saliva, true or false? Saliva will be an accurate test in the future. Yeah, I think true. Um, there have been some labs that have developed very good saliva tests. We looked at it early on with some of the previous protocols and it didn't perform nearly as well as the swabs and so we wanted to get good accurate results. But there are protocols out there and our lab is uh, actively working to obtain um, the, uh, the materials and the, and the protocols necessary to run a, an accurate saliva test. So um, coming, coming soon, we hope, okay. to Mississippi. Uh, true or false, Dr. Byers, college students who test positive are counted as the case in the county of residence listed on their driver's license. True or false? Well, they're, they're counted in the, in the county of residence, basically. And so, so that's how we count any case of, of anything in the state. And, and, and we do that for all diseases, not, not just COVID. Uh, but one of the things that we're um, certainly aware of is identifying those college students where they go to school and being okay. able to inform the county and inform the schools that yeah i may be from madison but i go to school in this county and there has to be some awareness so one of the things that we also do when we identify cases is we notify the colleges mm -hmm. but we have strong communication oh absolutely okay dr dobbs the majority of workplace outbreaks are seen in poultry processing chicken plants. Uh, false. I mean, we, we have seen uh, a good number of uh, cases in, in workers in, in poultry industry. Um, to be honest, a lot of those cases seem to be unrelated to the uh, facility itself. Uh, we have a little bit over 1,000 that have been documented from poultry workers, but we have 90,000 cases in the state, right? So a lot of other industries People in healthcare actually make up a lot larger proportion. It doesn't mean they caught it in the healthcare, but um, poultry industry is is not driving our spread in Mississippi. Okay, Dr. Byers, true or false? Contact tracing is a waste of time. Well, false. Um, contact tracing is an important tool, but it's not the only tool, right? It's one of those ways that we can identify those people who may have been exposed to COVID-19 infection make sure that they are quarantined appropriately, make sure that they're monitoring for symptoms. But again, that's just one tool in the tool chest. There are lots of different things. There's the case investigation, where we make sure the case stays isolated. There are health officer orders that we utilize to make sure that folks know that they need to stay isolated when they're infected. Um, you know, there's wearing a mask. There's restrictions for groups, both outdoors and indoors. There's restrictions in restaurants. So we do all sorts of things to, to reduce transmission. Okay, and our last question in this section, we'll have Dr. Dobbs, true or false? Flu kills more people than COVID-19. 
COVID-19 is far more deadly than uh, flu, so that's a false. Um, flu does kill a lot of people. It kills uh, tens of thousands of people every year. It does not kill 200,000 people every year, uh, thank goodness. And we're not even done. we got a long way to go. So um, it's, it's a, it's, it, most people don't die, but a lot of people do. So it is a very deadly virus. Okay, I want to, I'm going to go a little bit out of order here. I want to move ahead. We got a lot of questions about the upcoming fall and winter, so I want to ask you all about that. Dr. Byers, what are your thoughts on the upcoming fall and winter? Is Mississippi ready? What do we need to do? Well, first I would say make sure you get your flu shot because we are coming up on flu season, and, and that's going to be one of the ways that we, that we prevent um, the hospitals being overrun with, with flu infections, uh, protect the nursing homes, protect ourselves. So get a flu vaccine, do that before the end of October. It's hard to know what the next coming few weeks as we get into the fall are really going to be like. We know that we have a lot of COVID. We know that there's a lot of transmission. We don't know if we're going to start to see spikes in, in COVID. Um, we certainly, when you throw flu on top of there, we may, even if we have a mild season, that's going to put pressure on the healthcare system. And that's going to put pressure on the nursing home. So I think it's imperative that we continue to do these things where we limit transmission, but make sure you get your flu shot too. All right, well, we'll stay with you, um, Dr. Byers. Please explain to the public just very simply, how flu is different than COVID. How do people know if they have symptoms of flu? How do they know if they have symptoms of COVID? Or well, do they not know? Yeah, so so they're both viral infections. They're both transmitted in a very similar fashion. So when people cough or sneeze or speak and you're standing real close to them, you can get it that way. So you, it's transmitted in a very similar way. Uh, one of the big differences is we have a vaccine for flu. We don't for COVID yet. The symptoms are very similar, although the symptoms of COVID-19 can sometimes be more severe, but they can cause a fever. Uh, flu, when we think about it, classically, it's going to be fever, cough, sore throat, that general achiness and, you know, just feeling bad, feeling like a train wreck. COVID can be the same way. It could cause fever, cough, sometimes shortness of breath. One of the big ones is loss of taste and smell and if you have a new loss of taste or smell that's almost certainly going to be COVID but they have a lot of crossover so if you're having those symptoms it's important to see your doctor they can evaluate you for both and they can do tests for both and you know we know there are some things you treat the symptoms of flu what kind of treatments can you offer for folks with COVID uh, until a vaccine is available, do you just treat the symptoms? So that's that's great. So you know we have those antivirals that we use for for flu all the time, and there's you know there's going to be more antivirals this year to treat flu, and the, those are important because if you get those started early, especially when somebody's at higher risk, that can reduce the bad outcomes that can occur, that occur, that can reduce the the hospitalizations. With COVID, there is some antivirals that can be used for hospitalized patients, but for most outpatients, um, there's, there's not a treatment. It's, it's time, it's supportive care. And remember that a lot of people who are infected with COVID-19 don't even have symptoms. You know, it, it may be as high as 40%, so. Um, when do you think Dr. Byers is the best time to get a flu shot and how long is immunity? So right now, uh, basically before the end of October, so we recommend that you get your flu shot early. You don't want to wait till we start seeing a lot of flu activity. You want to have that immunity on board because it can take a couple of weeks to develop that immunity after the shot. We recommend one shot right now for the season. So we anticipate that it's going to be protective throughout the season. Okay. Okay, so it'll last throughout the flu season. Okay, we have a question from one of our folks that wrote in and it said, I have been watching trends and we seem to be coming out from under the first wave of infection. This will be for you, Dr. Dobbs. Now we have the house holiday season fast approaching. Do you think we should get out in front of the second wave, which I predict will be brought on by Black Friday? Um, 
even more than Halloween or families gathering for Thanksgiving. How? So, you know, we have several things coming up. We have Halloween. Uh, there is the traditional Thanksgiving and, and shopping on Friday, and then, of course, the Christmas holidays. So we know we're going to be dealing with both flu and COVID right now. So um, what would you say? A lot of folks want to know how to celebrate the holidays safely. Boy, you know, that, that's really tough because I know folks really want to get back into normal sort of holiday spirit. But, uh, you know, the same rules apply. The rules of COVID haven't changed. If you're around a bunch of people, they're going to be spread. If you're close to folks, it's going to spread. If you're not wearing a mask, it's going to spread. It's those same sort of things. So we need to keep up the precautions. We need to have a smaller, simpler Thanksgiving. We need to do more shopping online or, uh -huh. you know, or um, making sure that, you know, when we're in stores, we're doing these same sort of things. Whatever we do, if we can follow those simple guidances of wearing a mask when you're around other people, maintaining space, doing it outdoors, whatever you're doing, and keeping small groups. I do worry a lot of what we've seen as far as transmission, it's been social stuff among families. Um, I got a call from somebody the other day. They had a little two-year-old birthday party, and all it was, it was... Um, uh, one family and then his, his twin brother and his kids came over and his, and his, and his mom and, um, and a whole bunch of them got it. Um, so it's when you bring these people together who are not around each other all the time, you in introduce new vulnerabilities. So for our Thanksgiving, we're just going to do nuclear family. Right. Um, we're we're going to keep it tight. We're not going to travel. And, and I do really recommend that people have very small, simple, holiday gatherings, mostly with your nuclear family. So limit the travel. Limit the travel and limit the number because we don't want to end yeah. up, especially when you're getting big families, then we do expose folks who are maybe a little bit older, maybe some medical issues, and also have a wild break. Well, some of our questions um, come from moms wanting to know Halloween is the next holiday, and can they go out and trick or treat? And then a second question is, can the infections th uh, be spread through food? Um, you know, the first question on the Halloween thing is I've been thinking about that a good bit. It makes me very uneasy. Um, outdoors is certainly safer than indoors. Um, you know, the, 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 the cookie, the, uh, the candy transaction is a little bit worrisome. You're getting close to people. Yeah. And, you know, you got a lot of folks. And on my street where I live, we have usually hundreds of trick-or-treaters every day. I mean, every, every year. Um, I don't know. I don't know about that one. We'll be thinking about it, but you know. Well, maybe we can put some some guidelines out yeah. and think about it because I, I think a lot of people are wondering about people that. People are going to want to do stuff, but sure. um, maybe you know, um, come by, pick up some candy, sitting out in front of you. I don't know, just yeah. self service sort of stuff, <laughs> you know, um, without a lot of interface. And then the food thing, it's probably unlikely. I mean, okay. um, so we have questions about that. Yeah, and, I mean, it, it surfaces. I mean, it, it, it's theoretically possible. And you know, if you wanted to like let your candy sit for a day or something after you got it, just make sure there's no virus on it. But um, really, it's proximity to other people that's the big risk. Well, a lot of folks want to know, and we'll take it to Dr. Byers. Um, when can we stop wearing masks to work, to school? Is there an actual case death number to the mask mandate? Not at this point. I mean, we're still, we are still in the middle of this. We are not out of the woods yet. I think that we need to, even when we start that, that first dose of vaccine and when we start having vaccine roll out, the masks are still going to be an important step in preventing transmission. And so I think we're in it for, for a while um, longer. I think that we would have to see some real diminishing number of cases. Uh, nationwide and worldwide to really feel comfortable with with you know stopping mask use, stopping the social distancing and gosh it almost feels like it's become a normal part of our right. of our everyday life now and so in your opinion it's going to remain that way for a while we have a lot of folks that say is there any scientific proof and I don't know if we could say by the numbers, but is there any scientific proof from the CDC that the wearing of a mask will prevent people from con contracting COVID-19? Has there ever been such a, a test yes. conducted yeah. at the yeah. labs? Yeah. Oh, well, in the, 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 the labs. labs, yeah, definitely okay. labs. But, but there's also been a real world situation where there was a couple of hairdressers that were infected and, and you know, they had uh, tens of people that they, um, you know, provided services to 
during their infectious period. And they all wore a mask. Uh, the salon workers were wearing a mask. The patrons were wearing a mask. And the, the transmission was zero in that setting. And we would not expect that under normal circumstances. And there's a, and there's a, a huge study in, in, in JAMA um, from American Medical Association looking at um, pre and post in a hospital just with a universal masking, um, surgical masks, not in 95s. And they had a phenomenal response. So what about these, just the masks like this that folks are just out there wearing? Is this effective? It, it, it is going to be effective. Um, you know, there'll be some variability. And certainly, you know, we know that like the bandanas or maybe even the gaiters are not going to be as effective based on more like, um, you know, particle studies and, and how you breathe things out. So there's going to be some variability. I mean, there's not going to be a study of every type of cloth mask, obviously. Right. But, um, but you're better, I mean, it's always better to um, wear a mask. And, yeah. and, and remember, the biggest part about the mask is that is that you're, if you potentially are infected and you're not having symptoms, it's keeping you from spreading it to somebody else. And there's also a neat thing of um, maybe sort of uh, micro exposure. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of a new thing that we've really kind of learned more about, but it seems like, and this is from animal studies, um, where they had like hamsters exposed, either no mask material between them or some mask, like the normal kind of stuff we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And they would sometimes get infected but their illness was much less. And, and they think it may be because they had just a smaller dose of exposure, but then they may have actually developed immunity. So it's almost like it's a micro exposure for immunity. And there's a really nice sort of natural experiment between two cruise ships, one where they wore masks and one where they didn't. And then the ones where they didn't wear masks had a lot of really sick people and some folks died. And then the other one where they did wear masks, um, they did a lot better. And the people who got sick had much less illness. So we have some questions from folks that work in retail and they wear their masks they you know 8 10 12 hours a day and it's really upsetting to them when folks come in customers come in and refuse to wear a mask how do you negotiate that dr Duffs? you know i i, I kind of hate to tell somebody to run, run their business but you know it is it is the law right now um but people have a right to refuse service to people who um don't don't comply uh, so, you know, I, I think a polite say, you know, I'm sorry, so we won't be able to help you unless you wear a mask or something like that. I mean, always going to be polite and also make sure you have masks available for people. So if they forget them, because sometimes it's a frustration, though, for folks if they're not used to it. They come in and like going, Dad, come in, I left it at home. And if we can do something to help them, that's good. So I think the, the, the softer, nicer, more collegial approaches make the most sense. Okay. We um, have a question here. If a person has asthma, shouldn't they be the first people on the list to wear a mask since they have a lung problem? Yet everyone is now claiming to have asthma, so they are not required to wear a mask in public. Well, there's, <laughs> there's, there's no asthma exclusion in the executive orders. Um, yet everybody, I mean, it would be a pretty extreme case where I think someone couldn't wear, wear a face covering, right? Um, even a loosely fitting bandana. Um, is going to be a face covering officially now. The effect, but not is, children under two. It's children under two. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah definitely yeah. not. They don't need to, for sure. And even in executive order, it's six and under. Okay. Don't have to. So I, whenever that's come up, I did have some people say some stuff, and I said, well, you're probably just not wearing the right kind of mask. These masks are are very breathable. Um, they actually, I think they have copper in them too to kind of like bind anything mm -hmm. that's transmitting. But find a, a mask that's comfortable for you that you can wear. wear it, yeah. uh, and you know, I think that some of the ones that I've that I've seen and used are super thick, almost like denim, and you can't breathe through that. So right. get get one that works for you. Um, we get a lot of questions uh, from folks in the public about restaurants that are not complying with executive orders, and and we, of course, you can let us know at the health department on our COVID website, but what would you say to, in fact, we had a number of places in Flowood this weekend that were reported to not be complying. What would you tell folks? Don't go to the restaurant, don't give them your business, or, or I mean, people, we don't monitor, we are not the police, so. I, well, we will respond. Yeah, because we, yes. yeah. So, um, there's several things to consider in this. Um, so first and foremost, you know, if, I, if there's a place that hasn't been complying, um, 
I will obviously say something to the manager, but then I'm not going to use it. I will mm -hmm. not. I will not use them anymore because they obviously don't care enough about me to mm -hmm. protect me. Um, that I don't think that they are having. You know, they're they're not. You know, doing good uh, business for the customers. If someone is, you know, violating rules as far as that goes um, with the employees, especially, um, you know, if it's a restaurant, let us know. On our website, we have a, an online complaint form, and we'll go and educate and make sure that they understand the rules. Because sometimes early on, especially people don't really understand the rules, and let them know what they need to do to comply. Because part of it that does fall under our authority mm -hmm. uh, is a, for the licensing agency for restaurants. And then, you know, and, and if, if there's ongoing resistance, there can be some, um, some penalties and even you know forced closure. We haven't had to do that yet, but that's it's certainly plausible. The other thing is, I think like the people to realize is, with these executive orders, they're laws. Mm -hmm. You're breaking the law if you don't comply. And um, the immunity bill that is passed by the legislature, it it does give people legal immunity from COVID transmission if you're following the guidances. And so if you're if you're willfully not following the guidances then you're voiding your liability protections. And I think from a business perspective, I think it's a very unwise move. Okay. We're going to shift gears to schools. And I don't know, some of these you may or may not know, but um, Dr. Byers, will the vaccine be mandated for school children, the COVID vaccine when it comes out? Will it be mandated for school children? You know, I haven't heard that it, we, would, we would talk about mandating it for, for school children at this point. Um, you know, it, it's going to be interesting as as we as we get more vaccine, and there's going to be a tiered system, obviously, when we have you know limited doses to begin with, to determine um, who are those folks at the higher risk. Um, more than likely, those people on the front line uh, of healthcare uh, would be the would be the first folks to get it. But we'll have to kind of roll through it and see. But I'm not certain that we would that there's going to be a mandate for, for school children to, to get vaccinated. And would you think like H1N1, we would probably start with at-risk folks and um, frontline emergency workers? Yeah, that's, it's going to be a similar type of tier system where you where you look initially at those those people who are in the highest risk for for COVID based on, on their exposure risk. Uh, and that includes, you know, things like first responders and healthcare workers and Put, you know, people in long-term care settings, and we'll work through the tiered system like we did. So the, you know, very similar to what we did in H1N1, it'll be a tiered system that then opens up to the general population. Thank you, um, Dr. Dobbs. You just talked about COVID-19 infection and food. So we have a question: uh, Would it be beneficial if the school children would come home and shower immediately, or would washing their hands be enough to pursue? to prevent the spread if they came in contact with someone who might be infected. You know, it, it, that's not wrong to do that, um, to come uh, clean up in case it's on your clothes or something like that. I mean, it's plausible. You know, still mostly it's proximity. Um, but I will tell you that my, my wife who works in the hospital and, and has you know, worked pretty much every day since March, she runs the ICU um, in our town, um, takes a shower every day when she comes home. That's the first thing she does. And so it's, I don't have any evidence that that prevents infection, but it, it, it does intuitively make sense. Well, what about on the clothes? Yeah, maybe. Um, I think it's going to be kind of a low risk thing. I'm not sure I would okay. get too bent out of shape about it, but if it were something you wanted to do, I, I would say, you know, it's, it's a reasonable thing to do. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dobbs, why are all children in a class where only one test positive sent home for two weeks? Why not just send the one home who is sick? If the kids are wearing masks and social distancing, why would they have to go home? What would be the point of doing those things if you are in essence saying that they don't work? Uh, that last part I'm not quite sure. Um, oh, okay. So the um, we don't send all the kids home. Right. Can you explain the process? Yeah, so here, here's how it works. So if, and this is, this is a CDC definition of what a close contact is. If you spend 15 minutes within six feet of somebody who has coronavirus, then you're a close contact. So when there's a case in the school, if you're never within six feet of that person, you wouldn't be considered contact. And so you wouldn't go home except for in a larger outbreak scenario. 
So if, say we had 10 kids in a room mm -hmm. and we had one kid who was sick. Only those kids who were within that six feet for 15 minutes would need to go home on quarantine 14 days. Even if they had the mask on? Even if they had the mask on. Okay. Um, the mask does certainly help. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a layer of protection, but um, we, we need to, we want to keep our kids in schools. So we want to, you know, and the mask probably really help from these aerosol uh, issues with super spreaders. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's just one thing. There's a whole complement of responses. But those who are exposed need to go home for a little bit because they could be incubating the virus. And when they're incubating the virus, that means that they could become contagious before they know it and spread it to a whole bunch of other people. So basically, we're kind of, we're, you know, you got, a, you got an infection. We need to take that outer shell and just take it out of commission just for a couple of weeks just to make sure we don't have those, those subsequent waves of transmission and wipe out the whole school as far as being open. It's our objective to make sure kids can have the best opportunity for education and the socialization stuff that they need to do to develop. And, and, and I think it's actually been a, a pretty great success as far as like, you know, we, we've been able to keep kids in school a lot more effectively than I had, had thought. And we've only had a few schools have to close, close down as far as going all virtual. So it basically prevents those subsequent ways of infection. I know it's frustrating and it's aggravating, but the flip side of it is, I would say the schools should work through schools to make sure that your kids maintain that distance at all times and then we can avoid quarantine altogether. All right, Dr. Byers. I work at Mississippi State and I just don't understand how our campus COVID numbers can be accurate. Our numbers at the urgent cares and drive-throughs um, being reported in our results. Yeah, so, you know, um, if you're talking about what's reported from Mississippi State, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the college is going to report the, the number of cases that, that they are aware of within their students. We know that there can be some reporting problems from those students that are tested outside of the campus setting. You know, we're working on that to make sure that we identify those cases so that we can make sure that the college is aware. Because the ultimate goal in all of this is not just the reporting of the numbers. The ultimate goal is to identify those students who are infected, get them isolated, mm -hmm. identify those students who are contacts, get them quarantined because what we're trying to do is keep the college going keep the schools going so it's not just about the numbers that are being reported it's about identifying those cases and we're working to help the colleges do that okay i want to spend the last part of this talking actually about the virus which we did we got a lot of questions about the virus um so dr dobbs I experienced having COVID-19 back in May. Is there anything conclusive regarding reinfection chances for those of us that have been through it? Yeah, so there probably is some potential risk of reinfection. We're still learning more what that means. But um, we do think that uh, there is some degree of protective immunity. Um, that immunity probably, though, is not a hundred percent and it's not long-term durable um, and this is um, in many ways extrapolated from our experience with other non-COVID coronaviruses um, the way they generate immunity once you get um, exposed you do have an immune response but you're likely not to get it for a while right so basically the immunity mm -hmm. will last for a while whether okay. that's six months or two years like flu really kind of kind of flu like and we know some people it's probably minority but some people might get a reinfection, but it, we do believe it'll probably be a lot milder, maybe not contagious, maybe asymptomatic. So we're still learning about that, but we do think um, it certainly does have, have implications for the vaccine. Well, because, that's, yeah, I was going to ask you that. So if I tested positive for COVID-19, am I going to be on a lower tier to get the vaccine? I mean, am I protected without getting the vaccine? I think right now we're not rec going to recommend people get a vaccine. Or, or, or if they positive. tested positive. Yeah. Um, or do we know yet? Uh, I don't think that we know yet. Okay. And, and it may be very similar to what we did um, during H1N1 mm -hmm. that um, uh, everybody gets a vaccine. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll, we'll see as that guidance comes out. Stay tuned. Okay. Dr. Byers. Mm -hmm. If one person in your household is quarantined due to exposure to COVID-19, should other household members quarantine even if they were not subject to the exposure? No, if they hadn't been in contact, just being in contact to that person who's on quarantine, 
doesn't mean that you need to, to quarantine yourself. But you need to stay away from that person, right? So that person in the household really needs to be on quarantine. And what right. that means is staying away from everybody else because the whole purpose of that quarantine is to prevent that person who may be incubating, may be in that period where they develop infection, and we know that they can be infectious even a couple of days before they show symptoms. So the whole goal is to keep them from infecting anybody else. So if you've got somebody in your household who's on quarantine, you need to keep mm -hmm. them on quarantine away from everybody else. But you don't have to do anything separate unless you've been isolated. Okay. And we've talked about methods of transmission in which I'm understanding the respiratory is probably the strongest method. But we had someone write in, um, do we need to wash down, disinfect grocery supplies and packages? At first there were experts telling us to disinfect everything we brought into our home. Now I'm not hearing much about that and I'm wondering if it is necessary. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think it's probably necessary. I mean, we haven't seen outbreaks and stuff related to packages or, or stuff. I mean, I mean, is it potentially theoretically possible? Yeah, maybe. But I, I would say the main thing is is just hand hygiene. Mm -hmm. And you know, just you know, get your stuff, and you know, we want to wash your hands frequently anyway. And that's going to be sort of our backstop. Is um, you know, we'll hand wash them a little bit of um, hand sanitizer on a regular basis is probably the best preventive. Method. Okay. Um, we have gotten a lot of questions. We never used to use the word herd immunity, but I think people are used to hearing it now. And uh, we have a question about one of your tweets a while back. You recently tweeted that we're a long way from herd immunity. Has it been found that a person is in fact immune to COVID-19 after having it? Are you hoping we achieve herd immunity? Um, I think they're thinking more by getting, uh, from what I understand, we won't be able to achieve herd immunity from people getting ill. It will take a vaccine. Yeah, almost, almost certainly. Um, I saw someone today did an analysis, and they said, you know, based at this rate of infection, it would take us 10 years to reach right. herd immunity. It's so right. a long time. I don't want to wait 10 years. I've had enough. Um, but uh, yeah, so there is immunity, right? It's just, it's just kind of the flu. The, the, um, although I think it's going to be better than a flu shot, honestly. I think just the the way that the coronavirus is, it doesn't mutate quite as rapidly and that okay. sort of thing. So um, it's going to be it's going to be partial immunity. It's going to be uh, not lifelong. It's probably going to be what's going to, but it's I think it's going to be enough that if we get enough people vaccinated, we can reach a herd immunity type effect. Where where herd immunity basically is is there um, are enough people around you who are already immune that it's not going to be a chain reaction, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's going to be you know I might give it to Paul, uh, Dr. Byers. Um, but no one else around him is, is going to be really able to get it because they're immune, and so then it just stops. Like that, right. that sort of domino, it stops. Right. So uh, I do think we can get there, but we're going to have to have a vaccine almost certainly. Okay. Um, we have received a, a lot of uh, questions or comments about people in nursing homes and their loneliness and that how important it is to have family visits. And so I know now that we are allowing outdoor visitations. Can you talk a little bit about that, Dr. Myers? Yeah, so, you know, for those facilities, even if they've had a recent outbreak, if they've not had any cases for a couple of weeks, they can they can do outdoor visitation. And, you know, we've, we've provided those guidance for, for nursing homes, but also for other long-term care settings like personal care homes, assisted living centers, um, and so those are available and we've provided that to them. But basically, you know, you can have outdoor visitation. We've also got a process for nursing homes that's been outlined by CMS that's a phased approach that um, we have some criteria for how nursing homes can start through those phases and that will ultimately get them to um, have an indoor visitation. And so that's ultimately a goal to look, we understand completely that this has been not only traumatic for the nursing homes and the staff and the families for knowing the numbers of cases and knowing the numbers of deaths that have occurred, but also in some cases there's family members who haven't been able to see their loved one for weeks or months. And so we're aware of that and that can cause some trauma also. So we had one person write in that um, 
their loved one is hard of hearing mm -hmm. and that by wearing the mask they're not going to be able to hear. And so, because we say six six feet apart with the mask, right? Is there anything we can work out for people that may not be able to understand? Well, you know, certainly we could work individually with those nursing homes if they have questions about those, those situations as they arise. You know, some things that you could do is make sure that you're further away. I know that that makes it harder to hear. But you know, even even further than six feet, um, wear wear a face shield, and that that can help present, prevent some of that. Um, the, there's going to be potentially some risk, but if you if you keep them separated and you do your best and you follow those guidelines that we have outlined, and if you need to, give us a call and we can work through those those situations. Yeah, um, yeah, because that can certainly be heartbreaking. Um, let me see. Contact tracing, Dr. Dobbs. Uh, explain just very quickly, it's a pretty simple process that we use in determining all communicable diseases to stopping it and preventing it, but explain contact tracing quickly and tell me if you think we are doing enough of it now in Mississippi. Um, so contact tracing is a, is a mechanism by where you identify people who've been exposed and people who are going to be sort of like that next wave of infection and before they get sick you quarantine them, right? So that's how you sort of cut off that, that chain reaction and so we will contact the individual who is uh, diagnosed. We will then uh, contact individuals around them who have been exposed and then uh, and have them go on quarantine for a period of time so that they can't then spread it on to other folks. Uh, do we have enough? Um, no. Uh, we have pretty much diverted most of our, you know, a lot of our internal effort toward contact tracing and a lot of our nurses and other staff have been diverted to that effort. Right now, we are doing a detailed case investigation and contact tracing for those 24 and under, focusing on where we know our, our biggest risk of transmission is going to be. But we are in the process of bringing on another 100 um, right now that should be online pretty quickly. How quickly, Dr. Byers? Uh, hopefully within the next week. Okay, great. So that's going to greatly improve. And if we have lower numbers like we're seeing, we're able to kind of really stay on top of that. So once when we were having like 1,500 cases a day, absolutely unmanageable, absolutely insane. Um, and then you add on that the two-week lab delays, it was it was really, in many circumstances, not very helpful. Um, if I can throw something out there, you, you don't have to wait for somebody from the health department to contact you to know that you need to isolate if you are positive. And you know that if somebody's in your household who is a case, you don't have to wait for somebody to call you and tell you to quarantine. You know that you need to quarantine for 14 days from your last exposure. And there are guidances on our, our website about right. what isolation means, what quarantine means, what steps you should take. So please go to our healthyms.com COVID page. And I didn't get a chance to ask you guys this before we started. Do you know, uh, like for West Nile virus, we have uh, support groups. Do you know of any support groups for COVID survivors? I don't. I don't. I mean, there certainly should be one. And, and I remember with West Nile, yeah. it took a while before the support but group. There are going to be a lot of people with chronic issues after coronavirus. And some it's going to be after having a severe illness and then they have, you know, lung damage or kidney damage or whatever. But some of it is. This is not a lung infection alone. Yeah. It's a whole body infection. It infests your, your blood vessels. It can cause neurologic issues um, and cardiovascular issues. And that's one of the things, too, is we're still learning a lot about it because it's a new virus. Um, students, and, and so there was a, a recent study uh, in JAMA that looked at, at kids who had coronavirus, and guess what percentage of them had evidence of myocarditis by MRI? 15%. So 15% of kids who had coronavirus had heart involvement. For, for, and so we're still learning a lot, and there are going to be some manifestations that I think are going to be worse, and that's why it's so important. I don't want to get coronavirus. I take it seriously. I don't want it. I don't want my kids to get it. I don't want my wife to get it. Because um, not only do bad things happen immediately, but we don't know the long-term manifestations. So we had a question. Uh, from a lady who wrote in and said that she had been diagnosed and it's been five weeks 
and she still can't smell or taste. Do we have any feel, Dr. Byers, for, for when that can return? I, I think it's different for everybody. I, I, I've heard of some people who've, who've gone uh, a few weeks before they've regained that, that sense of taste and smell. Um, it doesn't mean you're still infected. It doesn't mean that they're um, that you're infectious or that you can pass it on to somebody. It just takes a while for that for that piece to come back after that infection. More or less, it kind of kills the nerves. It that damages just, those cells. Yeah. Well, yeah. let's talk about this. People might think, well, I can make it through COVID-19, but besides the loss of smell and taste, there are some real, real uh, long-term effects it can have. Dr. Dobbs, can you talk about that? Well, you know, when people get really sick. Um, you know, we, we do see, you know, kidney failure, um, you know, lung scarring, heart failure. Um, so those things do happen. I think one of the things that we're really going to see more about is going to be neurologic. I, I just keep an eye on it because I've talked to a lot of people and I say, you know, I'm just not as sharp as I used to be. Or I can't remember things like I used to. It does cause strokes. Um, it does invade neural cells. Um, so I, I, that that's the one that really worries me, honestly is long-term sort of neurologic manifestations, yeah, I know. Now, is that in all age groups, or? You know, uh, I, I, I've seen it more in older, like, like, you know, people my age and, and, and older, um, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're, we're still learning about it. Um, this, we have a question from um, the general public, I have two stepchildren that only come every other weekend for their visitation. They currently go to school and attend extracurricular activities like dance and baseball where masks are not required. I have a son that just turned one. Is it best for my stepchildren to wear a mask when visiting on their weekend visitation? Yeah, probably. I mean, one of the things that's going to be very important is you have to assume everybody's at risk. And especially people are coming and going, and, and you know, um, uh, teenagers, teenagers and, and college age folks are the highest risk because they are out doing stuff, and they're going to get exposed. Um, at high risk of getting it. So even even among family members, um, especially um, if it's not folks you see every day, uh, well, even if you are and you're doing stuff, I mean, it makes sense to wear your masks and, and maintain some space and, and spend most of your time visiting outdoors. Okay. We have gotten a lot of questions about, look, I tested positive and five weeks later I'm still positive. How do we know those folks aren't reinfected? Dr. Byers? Well, we know that that, that test, depending on the kind of test that they had, and if it's that PCR, mm -hmm. we know that, that that can stay positive for, for sometimes several weeks. And for those folks who are who are not having symptoms, um, and it's been a few weeks and they're still testing positive, I don't think that they're infected. I think that, as we talked about, that's just residual viral particles or viral genetic material. Um, so really, in, in CDC's guidance is this now, for individuals who've been infected, if you, you don't need a test for at least another three months and only then if you develop symptoms down the road. And so, um, and then you would just want to be evaluated by your by your doctor. And so, there's really not a need to test again if you've already tested positive. So this next question, I guess you would need uh, to be a fortune teller. But um, once the vaccine is available, how long before we are back to normal, or will will we ever be? Gosh, well, we, we all want to have some normalcy, um, and and I think that it's it's going to be a, a slow roll. It may be, you know, the, the first part of, of 2021, those first couple of three months before we even have enough vaccine to to really start vaccinating a large a large population. And even at that point, you know, most vaccinations are going to take us a, a second dose that's going to be potentially up to a month later. So I, I think that we're still, you know, I, I wish that I could, I could say, you know, it'll be six months or it'll be nine months, it'll be three months and we'll be back to normal. I think it's going to, I think it's going to be a while. I mean, um, you know, I think it may be a, at least a, another year, but, you know, I'm just pulling that out of my hat. 
Dr. Dobbs? Yeah, gosh, it's so hard to know. I, I do think it's going to be a gradual thing and not a flip the switch sort of thing, right? Um, and we may learn that you know we've got enough people with a power protect you know protection from the vaccine that maybe we can relax a little bit and maybe fly a little bit more. And but I, I don't think that we're going to be like normal, old normal for quite a little bit. Um, I think a lot depends on the vaccine, how effective it is. Um, I mean, if, it's, if it ends up being like super protective and, um, you know, long lasting immunity, boy, we'll be, at, we'll be getting back normal. I think the more likely scenario is partially protective with um, um, some duration of immunity that'll allow us to start to kind of like doing a little more. But, you know, we're doing a lot more now. I think we've learned ways to be safer. So I, I just would suspect that we're going to try to find ways to um, do our normal stuff in a different way. Okay. And then I guess my final question is we do we do get a lot of um, people don't seem to understand why they need to stay six feet away and wear a mask when they're outdoors. When they're outdoors? Mm -hmm. All right. So everything's risk reduction, right? There's no magic bullet, right? And so we need layers of protection. And this spacing is very useful because we know it's spread mostly by droplets. Okay, um, so I'm much less likely to get it from you from this distance. My risk is not zero, right? So where in this adds to your protection. Adds to your protection, yeah. okay. but also, and 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 again, I, I really think that this is going to end up playing out. Is I think the mask converts super spreaders to normal spreaders, and we never know who a super spreader is. Um, super spreader is someone who, if you put them in the wrong environment, they can infect tens, dozens of people within a, sh a short period of time. And by having a mask on, it converts those folks into much less contagious. So if, um, if we're in this space and we're both not wearing masks and you're a super spreader, I would feel no comfort by six feet of separation. Okay. We are, we're about out of time. Do each of you want to say just a, a last few words before we close? Dr. Byers? I, I would just say stay the course. You know, I, I think the, the buy-in that we're seeing now from Mississippians of utilizing the mask, of staying socially distanced, I think we've seen the payoff for that in uh, reduction of numbers uh, of cases. So just if we can if we can keep doing what we're doing um, by the time we do get a vaccine we're going to be in way better stead okay thank you dr Dobbs. you want to close for us yeah um you know stay safe and be patient um you know we've come a long way and and i do love what the governor said about you know 90 percent of people can do 90 percent of what they want to do and i think that's true um we still can't do some things and, and we don't like that and i'll tell you you know one of the things that i find so laughable is on some of the social media stuff people are like they think that we want to have more covid i mean heavens we have a lot of work to do without covid mm -hmm. you know i haven't had a single day off since march the 7th right and 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 i don't think dr byers has um you know this is hard work and we're yeah. doing it we're doing it for you guys right this is our job is to, is to try to make mississippi a healthier place i'm proud to be part of that effort but there's no personal benefit of, um, you know, that we gain out of having COVID patients or deaths. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, you know, I, I feel that we kind of feel like it's a failure to have more cases and a failure to have more deaths. Um, I know it's not all within our control, but um, we want there to be less COVID. We want COVID to go away, and we're going to do everything we can um, to, to make sure that we can contribute to that. And I, I did want to just ask you one more question. Every day we focus on the number of cases and deaths, but people need to understand that when we release the ca daily cases, that's not necessarily when the individual got sick. It's when right. it was reported to us. So Dr. Dobbs or Dr. Byers, what are the most important charts folks should look to to see the trends? Dr. Byers? Uh, I would look at, at, at what we have as our, as our epi curve, and that, that actually shows the cases by the time that they've occurred, so their event date. And you can track that a little bit better um, over time. You can see the peak and you can see the reduction of cases. And that's not going to be dependent upon the numbers of cases that we say every day, 
that's going to be dependent upon when the case actually occurred. So I would look at that. I would look at our deaths. I would look at our hospitalization data. Dr. Jackson, do you want to add anything? No, I, I think that's perfect. But also explore the website. There's a lot of we have a lot there of is, information yeah. on there. Yeah. We did add a new um, PDF on the mortality that shows our excess mortality. Um, it's killing Mississippians. There's just no no doubt about it. Um, so please, you know, go on there. Um, look at the, look at the information. There's probably some stuff that would surprise you. Okay. Well, thanks to both of you, and we appreciate all of you for watching. Um, may not be the most convenient time of day, but uh, we will look at your comments and see if uh, we should do this show again. But we thank you all for joining us, and please stay safe. Yeah, and, and follow us on social media. Always. We've got a lot of good stuff on there. Okay.